Produced by Marion Clare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFrandre, Mutual presents the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, a gala hour of music and song sincerely dedicated to better radio listening for your entire family. Featured highlight of this summer series is the career performance of a new vocal artist each week, a great opportunity for deserving young singers to start professional radio careers. Our stars this evening are Ruth Slater and Donald Graham, our instrumental soloist, violinist Robert Quick, and our career performance guest, coloratura soprano Dolores de Puglia. Our distinguished speaker is Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour. <laughs> Presenting our galaxy of summer stars and an uninterrupted flow of exquisite music contributed by the composers Schumann, Mendelssohn, Brahms, and Spielmann. The two grenadiers, the finale from the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, Love Everlasting and Flow Gently Sweet Afton. Ruth Slater, Donald Graham, violinist Robert Quick, the chorus and the orchestra, all under the baton of Henry Weber. Music on a summer night. <laughs> Returning to Grenadiers From Russia Their way they were making And when They came to the German frontiers Their hearts Were depressed And aching T'was there that they heard The sad story of war The throne of their country Had been shaken France had been conquered, her banners laid low, and the emperor a prisoner had been taken. Then wept in the sorrow and grief the twain, their thoughts to him ever turning. The first one spoke, I'm faint with pain. My wound still unhealed is burning, the other said, the end has come. I too would gladly perish, but I've a wife and child at home to love and guard and cherish. Oh, what a wife, a child to me. My thoughts to my emperor are flying. Let them beg for bread if they hungry be. My emperor in prison is dying. One boon I ask the ere I die. For death is o'er me creeping. And that, that my body in France should lie In soil of my country sleeping My cross of honor let me wear One as the flag's defender My musket to the grave I'll bear My sword I'll not surrender And there I'll lie till death And so I shall not rattle, and so I 
Uninterrupted spell of music on this summer night, presented as the first section of this evening's Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, starring contralto Ruth Slater, baritone Donald Graham, violinist Robert Quick, and conducted by Henry Weber. At this point in tonight's concert, it is our pleasure and privilege, as always, to present our distinguished speaker of this broadcast series, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, outspoken American patriot, and noted world historian. Tonight, Colonel McCormick will speak on the preamble to the North Atlantic Pact. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. The North Atlantic Pact consisting of Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States, contains this extraordinary language. They are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples. Founded on the principle of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Actually, the European countries have nothing in common excepting the Roman occupation and the Crusades. They have nothing at all in common with the United States. The first English colony was planted on this continent in 1607. Other colonies followed until there were one Scotch and 16 English colonies. There were many noble owners of shares, but they did not migrate. The immigrants came because of religious, political, and economical difficulties at home. Differing from other Englishmen at the time of the departure, the difference increased with separation. By the time of the Revolution, there were families who had not seen a superior in 170 years. Forbidden to pass any laws that contravened the laws of England, they did so. They forced changes in their charters and constantly quarreled with the royal authorities. In these quarrels, they became great students of government. By 1774, they had produced the greatest statesman the world had ever seen, preponderantly from Virginia, but also from the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. 
Freedom of religion was adopted in several colonies before the Revolution, and in others the state church was defied by dissenters. Although the colonists had proved the superior soldiers of the French and Indian Wars, the English upper class not only felt that its legal superiority, but believed that as an upper class it must have a military superiority to the colonials, and was confident that it could conquer the colonies in war. As we know, the colonists won in the seven years of the Revolution, killing or capturing most of the invaders and driving the rest overseas. When the settlers came over, they were guaranteed all of the rights of Englishmen. As time went on, the English government sought to take away their rights, while the colonists insisted upon rights that Englishmen of their ancestry never aspired to. As the quarrel fared, constitutional leaders exchanged views in debate, in public speeches, and in letters. The English-speaking population of what was now Canada and of Bermuda and the Bahama Islands sympathized with the Revolution, and many of them came to the United States after the Revolution. Efforts to organize a united colonial government had failed. The New England colonies organized for war against the Indians and French fell apart. Franklin's plan at Albany Leicester, the Dutchman's plan at New York, failed of approval, while Galloway's plan in 1774 failed by only one vote. Committees of correspondence were followed by the Stamp Act Congress, the First Continental Congress, then by the Second, by which the Declaration of Independence was passed. Following the example of Virginia and upon the advice of Congress, all of the states adopted constitutions. These were quite different in the beginning, but they've come around to great similarity. They all contain bills of rights, as did the Constitution of Texas and that of the Confederacy. The Continental Congress was able to make war successfully, to make treaties, and to make peace. In 1781, it was succeeded by the Confederation a government in advance of the Continental Congress and far in advance of any other government in the world. It passed the ordinance for the government of the Northwest Territory, of which Daniel Webster said, We are accustomed, sir, to praise the lawgivers of antiquity. We help to perpetuate the fame of Solon and Lycurgus. But I doubt whether one single law of any lawgiver, ancient or modern, has produced effects of more distinct, marked, and lasting character than the Ordinance of 1787. Following a convention at Annapolis, it authorized the calling of the Constitutional Convention, which framed the Constitution of the United States, a great improvement upon the Confederation, but lacking the necessary guarantees of liberty, a Bill of Rights of ten amendments was passed soon after. Britain, after the departure of the Romans, was conquered in turn by the English, the Danes, and the Normans. Several other invasions from Germany and France changed her rulers. The country was a kingdom, interrupted from time to time by usurpations and parliamentary insistence, until the death of William III of Holland, after which it became an aristocratic oligarchy, and remained so until recently. Whereas it has been our policy to establish a number of independent states united for certain purposes into a national government, the English policy has been to unite the component parts of the British Isles into one central government. Wales was conquered and not given representation in the British Parliament until Henry VIII. Ireland was conquered. An Irish Parliament was organized, which was bribed to vote itself into the British Parliament. The Scotch Parliament also voted for union, some say by bribery. The different countries represented in the British Parliament have always been causes of discord. 
Ireland finally won her freedom, but before that was a decisive factor in breaking down the old British Constitution. Agitation in England to abandon the rotten boroughs and follow the American example of representation according to population after its adoption by Belgium were defeated by the House of Lords. It was carried in the House of Commons by Irish votes, which were not interested in the principles, but wished to overthrow their Tory oppressors. Upon the insistence of the House of Commons, William IV threatened to appoint enough peers to change the complexion of that body, whereupon the House of Lords voted the Reform Bill. This precedent was followed when the House of Lords voted against Asquith and Lloyd George financial plan, when the House of Lords was compelled to accept a provision that any measure passed three times by the House of Commons became the law, the House of Lords to the contrary notwithstanding. Because of this provision, the House of Lords had been unable to prevent constantly increasing radical measures. Until now, socialism has come and the country is bankrupt. The Bill of Rights has been nullified. Men are imprisoned without trial and property is taken without compensation. In the War of 1812, England, which had now become Great Britain, tried to break up the United States but were defeated on land and sea. Thereafter were continuous boundary disputes extending all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific coast. There was a near war over the main boundary and the boundary of Oregon was only settled after the United States threatened war. To the south, as we heard last week, there was an undeclared war with Spain and near war with England and France over the question of Texas. California was annexed because the American Commodore Sloat got his soldiers on shore before an English captain acted. As late as 1896, England sent a fleet to this continent to threaten us during the Venezuelan dispute. It was only due to the emergence of Germany as a world power and hostility to the English in Africa that they took our side in the Philippines after having joined a continental combination to oppose our freeing Cuba. Not only are our institutions and liberty of our own creation, but secured in spite of Great Britain and France. The history of Canada is not dissimilar from our own. The English government, thinking it had been too liberal with the 13 seceded colonies, imposed a harsh military rule on all of Canada. This was resented. Britain tried, as it had in several of the other colonies, to create a colonial aristocracy by giving many lands to a privileged few called the Family Compact and the Chateau Clique. This was resented even by the Tories. Discontent was increased when Canadian soldiers invading the United States in the War of 1812 saw the freedom existing here. The governor at Montreal allowed the wilderness to grow up between Lake Champlain and that city to keep out Republican ideas. But to the St. Lawrence River and the lake so easily crossed, Profitable smuggling both ways created an illegal intercourse. Political agitation led to uprisings which were easily put down, but which created greater discontent. As elective governments were achieved, they imitated the earlier continental methods of refusing to vote supplies. Finally, a government approximating and probably imitated after Hamilton's plan for a constitution, right of veto. This power is supposed to have lapsed. Our system of plural states, called provinces, was followed. Hamilton's plan for a national bank was imitated. There are now only 10 banks in all Canada. For a while, influential Canadians were beguiled with British titles, but this custom has been abolished. Having obtained its independence from England under the statute of Westminster, the Canadian government assumed the former oppressive power to the mother country. Canadians are imprisoned and arrested without trial by both federal and provincial governments. 
Recently, the Montreal Gazette said, the Canadian Parliament, though without any restriction in favor of a free press, does possess very specific powers which could be used severely to limit the freedom of any Canadian newspaper. Among other things, it can declare libelous any criticism of the government. It can provide for a protective custody of journalists in order that they might not libel the ministry. It can provide special juries selected by the authority of the day. It can increase taxes on a subscription prices and on advertisements until these taxes become confiscatory. It is also apparent that at least under the workings of the North American Act, the provinces have made or have been prepared to make serious inroads in freedom of the press. There was the British Columbia Special Powers Act, which would have empowered the provincial government to confiscate the property of any newspaper it disliked. There was the Quebec Padlock Law, which denied the freedom of the press, along with freedom of speech, assembly, and association. There was the Alberta Press Act, the only one of these acts disallowed by Ottawa. Nor is it possible to turn from the Canadian government to Canadian court for an ultimate protection. It will be seen from the foregoing that Canada does not follow either American or English institutions. The three Scandinavian countries claim a common ancestry. They've been scrambled and unscrambled several times by the great powers. In 1814, while under a Danish king, Norway adopted a government much like ours. In 1821, it abolished titles of nobility. Given to Sweden by the Congress of Vienna, it declared its independence in 1905, but was compelled to accept a king in deference to the monarchies of Europe. Discontented with the warlike and overbearing king, Sweden established a constitution in 1809. In 1844, the right to suppress newspapers was abrogated. In 1865, a government of two houses and a king was established. Absolute monarchy remained much longer in Denmark, indeed until after our civil war. A kingdom of the Netherlands was set up after the fall of Napoleon, with a constitution modeled on the then Constitution of England. In 1831, Belgium rebelled and established a constitution beginning with our Bill of Rights. This in turn was copied by Piedmont, in, which became Italy, under the leadership of Garibaldi and Cavour, and retained the constitution until Mussolini. Italy has now established a republic and guarantees religious liberty but the guarantee is not observed. Portugal had always been an absolute monarchy. When the king was dethroned, anarchy succeeded until a dictator in the person of Salazar took over the government and rules efficiently but despotically. All of the European countries except the Scandinavian are oppressing hopeless, helpless people with the use of American money. France has been the enemy of all the other countries. It was a monarchy until the revolution of 1789, after which it has gone through 10 different governments of varying character and is now about 40% communist. From the foregoing, you will see that the preamble of the Atlantic Pact is totally without truth. Speaking from the concert stage of the Chicago Theater of the Air, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has been heard in another of his informative weekly commentaries, presented as a public service feature of this broadcast series. Free copies of tonight's preamble to the North Atlantic Pact may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. The Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour continues as Henry Weber and the orchestra present Malaguena by Ernesto Lecuona.
Ladies and gentlemen, the weekly featured highlight of the Chicago Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, Career Performance. This is the thrilling moment in each of these summer concert hours when a new vocal discovery steps before our microphones to make a coast-to-coast -coast bid for future stardom, a first major network career performance. The most successful of these new career performance artists, as judged by your letters and postcards, may well become your favorite radio and television personalities in the years that lie ahead. Your comments are very important to these artists and will reach us care of the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. Here to present the career performance of this evening's new vocal discovery is our first lady of the Chicago Theater of the Air, Miss Marion Clare. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Not so very many years ago, a teenage girl from Englewood, New Jersey, suffered spinal complications which indicated that she might be bedridden for the rest of her life. However, a delicate operation proved successful, and her recovery was assured. While she was recuperating in the hospital, following this spinal operation, a tonsillectomy was also performed by an old army doctor. Whatever this old doctor did later proved to be a blessing in disguise, for shortly after leaving the hospital, the young patient made the remarkable discovery that she could sing. Then followed voice training and varied singing experiences, each new appearance a valuable stepping stone toward a professional vocal career. That young lady is in our studio now as our career performance guest of the evening. Her name is Dolores de Puglia, a New Jersey-born daughter of Franco-Italian parentage. As a child, she was an accomplished pianist, and appeared in her first concert at the age of seven. After her hospital experiences, she made the transition from piano to voice, and at 15 won her first vocal contest. While still a sophomore in high school, Mr. Puglia was chosen to represent her school in the New Jersey All-State Chorus, and received even greater honors when she was chosen as one of the soloists. Her professional career as a lyric coloratura soprano started when she appeared at the New York World's Fair in 1939. Since then, her story has been told on the noted radio forum, We the People, and she has appeared in regional concerts, as well as guesting on local radio programs. Mr. Puglia is now preparing for the opera and has reached a point where national recognition can do much toward the furtherance of her ambitions. As the first work in her career performance this evening, Mr. Puglia is to sing the waltz song from Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, Miss Dolores de Puglia. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
song from Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, presented as the first selection in the Chicago Theatre of the Air career performance of Dolores de Puglia. As an encore, Miss de Puglia is to sing If I Were on the Stage and Kiss Me Again from the operetta Mademoiselle Modiste by Victor Herbert. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have presented the career performance of the young lyric coloratura soprano Dolores de Puglia, spelled small d-e, capital p-u-g-l-i-a. Again, we'd like to remind you that your comments mean a great deal to the future careers of these young singers. One week from tonight, the Chicago Theatre of the Air will become part of the 20th annual Chicagoland Music Festival starring Lauritz Melchior and Nancy Carr. The broadcast will originate at Soldiers Field in this city and will play before an audience of nearly 100,000. The young singers to be featured will be the winners of the 1949 Chicagoland Music Festival Vocal Contest. Two weeks from tonight, our summer concert hour will continue as usual, and our career performance guest will be tenor Brent Williams. For your cooperation in building these new careers, we sincerely thank you. Thank you, Mary and Claire and Dolores de Puglia.
Again, our galaxy of summer stars and a specially orchestrated series of memorable scenes from the Broadway musical sensation, Tales of the South Pacific. Ballet High, Wonderful Guy, and Some Enchanted Evening. Ruth Slater, Donald Graham, Henry Weber, the chorus and the orchestra.
you find your true love, when you feel her call you. Fly to her side and make her your by Mary Ann McClare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFrandre, this Argo Theater of the Air Summer Concert Hour, sincerely dedicated to good radio listening for every member of your family. this evening were Ruth Slater and Donald Graham, our instrumental soloist, violinist Robert Quick, and our speaker, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Our career performance guest was Dolores de Puglia. Your opinions of Miss de Puglia's work will reach us care of the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. One week from tonight, the 20th annual Chicagoland Music Festival, starring Lawrence Melchior and Nancy Carr. This is Lee Bennett speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.